It feels really awkward not having my mask on right now. <laughs> I feel like naked or something. You know, where's my hijab? <laughs> anyway, so uh, it's, um, and before that I was a teacher at a number of schools. I've taught at John Fraser Secondary, I've taught at Brad Malise Secondary, uh, at T.L. Kennedy, and at Gene Augustine. So all around Brampton and Mississauga. Just by a show of hands, how many people are from Peel? Like Brampton, Mississauga area? Okay, so the majority of you. So you kind of know the schools that, that I'm talking about. Uh, before becoming and going to admin, I was uh, a guidance counselor for a decade. And I was also um, a science and biology teacher. I also taught ESL. I taught special education, as well as credit recovery for those who don't know what credit recovery is. So I've put my email address here at the, at the front here. If you have your camera and you want to take a picture of it, you can. You're more than welcome to contact me anytime you wish, OK? Um, I'm going to talk a bit about it here. But if you are having difficulty at school, if you're having difficulty with the teacher, uh, if you're having difficulty with your administration, if you're being bullied, something's happening to you, and you don't know who to ask for help, in the school system, please contact me. I will help you, inshallah. Okay, so please uh, make sure you have it down there. If you have a camera, I'll give you a couple seconds. Put your camera out. Take a quick picture. I'll give you 30 seconds. No one say their camera's out? I guess uh, Brother Ron's lecture on social media scared everybody, right? It's very easy. Omar.zia at plsb.com. All, all, all of your teachers in school have exactly the same format. First name dot last name at plsb.com. No one cares? Okay, don't worry about it then. I will not be expecting any calls from anybody here. Maybe online though, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> they'll memorize it. <laughs> okay, so, so we'll get started. Um, I'm gonna be reiterating some of the same information you heard here today, but in a different type of a context. Uh, in today's region of Peel, and really across Ontario, perhaps around the world, Islamophobia is a real thing, right? We've all seen it. We've seen other people experience it. Perhaps we've experienced it as well. We saw what happened in 2017 at the masjid in Quebec. We all saw what happened just a few months ago in London, Ontario, where my in-laws live literally right around the block from where that incident occurred in London, Ontario. My, family's, my wife's family is from London, Ontario. Um, and we may have heard what happened at IMO just last summer. Some of us may have heard of massages being broken into, a spray painting happening on them. And some of us, you know, if we have a uh, family who wear hijab, maybe they've been intimidated or bullied or someone's called them names. So these are rea this is the reality. Islamophobia is real. And the question is, is it new? I'm asking, is it new? When did Islamophobia start? How many years ago? 1400. <laughs> oh, thank you, Brother Dahar. Such a wonderful student, mashallah. <laughs> 1400 years ago, Islamophobia started, right? So it's not something new, which means it's not going away. Until the day of resurrection, Islamophobia is going to be there. So it's something that we have to understand what it is, what it'll look like, but more importantly, what can we do about it, right? So my, my topic today is standing up for yourself. So I'm going to take you through a few uh, slides to get your mind thinking about it. Am I in the way? Can you guys still see? Okay. So what do you do? The principal of your school says there cannot be Jumma because there's no staff supervisor. It's real, this happened. This happened. Happened at a school called Bramley Secondary School just last year. Okay? What would you do? Uh, oh, okay, sure. Yep, I will just use my phone for my notes. Your teacher says in class, Islamic Heritage Month, more like Jihad Heritage Month. Am I right, Mohammed? And the teacher starts laughing. What would you do? Because this really happened. This happened two years ago in Peel. In two schools, something very similar happened. Here's another one. You have a supply teacher, and while looking at, at the class, he points at a Muslim girl with a hijab and says, what's that thing on your head? Are you bald under there, or did you have a lobotomy? And then starts laughing, and this is real. Supply teacher no longer working in Peel, but this is real. If you were in the class and you saw this happening, what would you do? What would I do? What would any of us do if we experienced this? You turn on the news, and the news anchor is reporting on the situation in Afghanistan. And within her report, she says, and I feel so bad for the women here, right? They'll be oppressed under the Islamic Sharia now that the Taliban are back in power. Right? And this was, anybody know what news station this happened on? CBC. Just last two weeks ago. On the cover of news magazine, you see a picture of Uyghur Muslims in cages in China. What would you do? If you saw this, maybe you have. 
And here are a few more scenarios. In the hall, a non-Muslim student looks at you and then suddenly raises their hand fist in the air and yells, yells at Allahu Akbar. What would you do? How would you react? Especially if you're in grade 9 and that person's in grade 12. Especially if you're South Asian, that person's white. Your social science teacher, while discussing faith in families in grade 11 anthropology, HSP 3U for those who have taken the course, randomly says it's so impractical to pray five times a day. A custodian looks at a Muslim boy who has a beard and says to him, uh, like that terrorist beard, here's a quarter to pay a rat to not off or eat it off. These are all real examples, and there's more and more and more of them. So the reason I gave you my email address at the beginning is because I chair a group of employees in the Peel this is School Board called MEEP, Muslim Employees Association, Association of Peel. And we are the people that they call for support when incidents like this happen. We are the people that parents call and the students call up when incidents like this happen in the classroom or in the hallways or in the community. If you're in grade 9, grade 10, or grade 11, or grade 12, it doesn't matter. You may have experienced this, heard about it. Inshallah, I hope that you never have to experience these things in life. But this is the reality of Islamophobia in public schools. If you go to Catholic school, believe me, it's 100 times worse. I know because my brother went to St. Joe's, okay, in Mississauga. So what happens in these situations? What would you do? How would you react? What would you feel inside? When Brother Dilaw was, was speaking to us, he mentioned the hadith of what you do when you see something wrong. Stop it with your hand, your voice, at the very least, hate it in your heart. I hope that as you're, listening, you're looking and watching and reading these, these scenarios, at the very least, you're feeling something in your stomach or something in your heart that this is wrong. Like if this happened to you, I hope that you would feel anger. I hope that you would feel disappointment, perhaps sadness, and perhaps the motivation inside yourself to feel I gotta do something. Can't stand back and watch this happen. The reason MEEP, Muslim Employees Association Peel, was formed, for those who are not aware of what happened in 2017 in Peel, the Quran was ripped up and thrown on the ground and stomped on in the boardroom at one of the board meetings. And for four meetings in a row, Islamophobes are showing up by the hundreds. The place was packed. About what issue? Does anybody know what they're arguing about and so upset about? I know the imams were there. The Friday prayer. They wanted to remove it from Peel schools. But the community showed up. 400 Muslims showed up. Parents, students, former students, lawyers, human rights lawyers from the Muslim community showed up and fought against it. NCCM got up and fought against it. And a bunch of teachers working in the back scene fought against it. And that's where the employees got together and formed that organization so that the Friday pair could still be an accommodation in the Peel Board. Right? So it's very, very important that when we see these examples and hear about them, we need to feel something inside of ourselves physically, biologically, neurologically. Something has to change. We cannot allow for this to happen. It's the same thing as Brother Dawah was saying that when you see something wrong, the whole snitching thing should be out the window. It's dumb. Use our wisdom, use our hikmah, and do something about it. But our default position, and this is not a Muslim problem, this is a human being problem. We see something, we see somebody falling down the street as we're driving along, do we stop and help them or do we keep driving along? If you see somebody getting bullied in the parking lot or in the gym locker room, do you do something or are you just going to keep walking along? Someone's being laughed at, do you, keep, you, 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 keep, you do something to stop if the person from being laughed at or do you keep walking on? What do we do? As human beings, our default position is complacency and inaction. Why? What's stopping us from doing anything? I'm asking. From amongst the kids, please. <laughs> what is stopping us from doing anything? Why are we so complacent? What, what do we, what's holding us back? Please, thank you. Fear. Thank you. Fear. Humiliation, and the fear of being humiliated for standing up. What else? Suspension. Suspension, that we might be the ones targeted as a result of trying to stand up for something wrong, right? It's like sometimes, you're, you don't ever talk in class, and the one time something bad's happening, you say something, you get in trouble for it, right? <laughs> I mean, there I know it. I saw another hand back here, please. Feeling out of place. Feeling out of place, absolutely. Anything else? 
So this is, this is very normal. This is actually what does happen, right? Fear is the driving factor and all the other reasons mentioned are amplified. Amplify the fear inside of ourselves. It's normal to feel that way. I feel it. All of us will feel it. It's normal, okay? But that's the default position all human beings are born with. This is the reason that we have in our deen the teachings that we have to overcome that fear. We have to overcome that complacency and that inaction. And our deen itself teaches us to advocate and specifically to self-advocate. What does self-advocacy mean? I'm asking. Yes. To speak out. Thank you. What else? Stand up for yourself. Thank you. What else? To, to, to assert your rights. Thank you. In a classroom setting, teacher is talking about something, introducing, introducing Snell's law, and you're getting confused. What do you do? Sit there and just let it happen? What do you do? Yeah, you ask questions. Ask questions, right? You're walking to school, you've got your project in your both hands, you get to the door and you can't open the door because your hands are occupied with your backpack and your laptop and your giant project you have. What do you do? Just sit there? The door's gonna magically open for you, what do you do? Ask, ask for help. Ask questions, ask for help, right? Ask somebody around you. Ask for support, right? So this is self-advocacy. And this is the beginning of how we start overcoming the fear, overcoming the complacency, overcoming the inaction that cripples us and, and prevents us from becoming the best that we can be. Why is self-advocacy a good thing? Anybody else from the comic? Hmm? Okay, good try, think about it. Our parents are not going to be there for us when we get older. If I get in trouble at work, can I go to my mother and father and say, you know, I'm 46 years old, can I go to my father and say, please come and help me out? Am my superintendent's upset with me? Can I do that? Oh, I'd probably lose my job, right? Our parents are there for us when we're younger, that's fine. But now that we're in grade nine and we're becoming older, feeling that independence, getting that freedom, right? Our parents are not going to be there for us. This is the comic where a guy is going to his first day at work and his parents are saying, sorry, he's late for work. We forgot to brush his teeth. Our parents are not going to be there for, for, there for us forever. So we do need to develop the self-advocacy skills so that we can be successful in the long term, right? Self-advocacy is so important for our independence and long term for our success. Success at school and success at work, right? I'll give you a funny phenomenon that's happening. Um, during COVID times, here's a question for you. Who's doing most of the homework during COVID? The parents or the kids? Neither? <laughs> it's the parents. The amount of plagiarism that we have caught from parents doing work for their kids in the past year is phenomenal. Right? It's, it's, it's mind boggling. Parent got into an argument with a teacher and in the argument about the mark and then the, in, the, in the argument, the parent says, but I spent five nights on that essay, <laughs> right? So it's real, it's happening, right? But our parents cannot be there for us forever, right? Did you know when you're 18 years old, your parents cannot talk to the principal or the vice principal? You have to talk to them? Yeah. And when you go to university and college, inshallah one day, your parents cannot talk to the dean or to the registrar's office, we have to, right? Each of us individually have to. So it is so important for us to, to, to ensure that we develop these skills. The question is, do we have to? Like, what if I just like, paid my parents, you know, just come out, I'll hire you as my advocate, my lawyer, and you just come with me to work and advocate on my behalf, right? Do we have to as Muslims? Yeah, the answer is on the board. <laughs> is the answer yes or no? Okay, what does it say? You're hufa then here, right? So what does it say? Someone read for us? I'm not a habit, so someone else read for us, please. Anybody. Everybody shy all of a sudden? Please. Thank you. It's out there. Who can translate it for us now? Well, that's the hard part, right? <laughs> okay. 
the best of my ummah, right? Kuntum khayrun ummah. The best of my ummah, akhrajat linas to to who to come out of humanity, right? The best out of humanity. Ta'muru ta'muruna bil ma'roof. Are those who do what? Amal bil ma'roof. It was just mentioned in Brother Dalawar's lecture, right? To enjoin the good, right? Wa tanhauna anil munkar, which is to forbid the evil, right? And don't forget and remember Allah. Remember, right? remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the answer is we have to. We don't have a choice. The ayah is clear. We have to learn how to self-advocate. We have to learn to stand up for what's right and stand against what is wrong. To be vocal about it and to use whatever position we have to do so. Did I translate okay? <laughs> well, we'll let pass for now. <laughs> you can correct me later. Okay, how, okay? So I'm gonna teach you a little bit, five steps on how to self-advocate, okay? This is just a short, a part of self-advocacy. Self-advocacy requires a lot of practice. Practice with our parents at home, practice with siblings, practice in a place like a masjid, practice at school, practice in the community. There's so many times to practice self-advocacy, to ask questions, to get help, to stand up for ourselves, to stand up for someone else when they can't stand up for themselves, right? Probably one of the hardest things we're ever gonna do in life is negotiate with our parents. I don't wanna wash the dishes today. I wanna play my video games, right? I want to, I, I, need, I have to memorize Quran, I can't do the dishes tonight, right? I have my homework, right? We have to learn how to negotiate at home sometimes with our mothers and fathers, right? Mothers are more hard to negotiate with. Mashallah, um, Increase all of our mothers and grant them all dental for those, inshallah. Um, we also have to ensure that when it comes to self-advocacy, uh, it's a skill that is developed over time through practice, but also through learning how other people self-advocate. Listen when we are in school. Look at the other leaders in the school, the SAC presidents, the athletic presidents, you know, those are the coaches out there. If you yourself are getting involved in leadership, Learn and listen how other people self-advocate for themselves so that you can learn other strategies from those around you as well. Okay, let's go through the stages. Identify and clarify. When it comes to standing up for ourselves, asking questions, seeking help, uh, standing up for us when someone's harming us, we have to ensure that we know what exactly is the issue. We have to be able to name it. That's bullying, that's racism. That's Islamophobia. That's anti-black racism. We have to be able to name it because the one thing that you ever talk to a bully, whether it be a teacher, a boss one day, the principal for that matter, or a fellow student, the second you say, that's racist, you see the demeanor of the person change. That's Islamophobic, that's anti-Muslim hate. As soon as we name what it is that's happening, there's clarity. Right? For the one doing, for the perpetrator of the crime and the one who's advocating for it to stop. Okay? Naming it. Once we name it, then we can come up with a plan, then we can look at the effort that we're going to put into the plan, we can look at strategies, and we can develop a solution. If we don't know what the problem is, you're hurting my feelings. Right? You, you pushed me. Right? You physically assaulted me. Right? You physically assaulted me. You're harassing me. Right? We have to learn the words so that we can name what is happening. That's how we begin uh, the process of self-advocacy. Step number two is probably the most important, especially when we're young. Finding somebody who we trust and who is reliable to support us when we need it. Sometimes that might be our parent. Sometimes that might be our administrative staff, might be our teachers. It might be a police officer. It might be a storekeeper, it might be the imam at the masjid, right? You have to take time, and I want you to take a moment right now, and ask yourself the question, who are the supporters in your life? I'm asking, share, who are the supporters in your life? Anybody? Parents. Your parents? How many people believe their parents are their number one supporter? How many people believe their teacher might be the number one supporter? What about the Imam at the Masjid? There's only a couple of hands going up. Come on here, man. <laughs> okay. 
So it's important to find somebody who you know is trustworthy, someone who's reliable, someone who's knowledgeable about the system. So if you're dealing with Islamophobia in schools, that's why I talked about MEEP, and that's why I gave you my email address at the, at the beginning. So if you are in trouble and you don't know where, where to go and you have Islamophobia happening in your school and you need help, reach out to me. Reach out to people around you. Okay? Find a Muslim teacher, find a Muslim EA, a Muslim secretary, a Muslim custodian. Right? They're everywhere in Peel. Okay? So find someone who can actually help. Number three is confidence. So the Bakra, verse 286, is the last few words. Someone complete it for me. Anta Maulana. Say it, say it. Thank you. So, this is probably the most important part of self advocacy, and it's the key that only Muslims seem to have. The concept of tawakkul al Allah is unique to our deen. La hawla wa la quwata. Only with Allah, illa billah. Confidence comes when we know Allah has our back. When we know Allah has our back, we have nothing to fear, right? We don't have to worry about the people who are gonna try and bring us down. We don't have to worry about personal humiliation. We can drive fear away with the confidence that comes when we know Allah is taking care of every one of our needs, right? He's got our back, and who's gonna, who's gonna win a war against Allah? Nobody, right? So this is the key that we have as Muslims, and this is why, as Muslims, it becomes easier for us to self-advocate, because we've been commanded to do so, but we also know that Allah SWT is gonna have our back when we have to do it. We talked about speaking up, that was also mentioned in terms of self-advocacy. And when it comes to speaking up, it's important to Ask for assistance when necessary. Sometimes our voices themselves might not ring as loud. But if we have a supporter, those voices ring a lot louder. So when I was a teacher many years ago, John Fraser, there was a student who experienced anti-Semitism, right? In their English class, unfortunately, there were some uh, remarks against the Jewish people. The kid came to me only because I'm a person of faith. But he came to me because he knew that the teacher's voice rings a lot louder than the, than the student's voice. Okay, sometimes you might want to go, to, and I, of course I dealt with it at the time, you might need to go to a senior if you're a junior, right, if you're in grade 9, your you're, you're first year, find someone in grade 12 who can speak up to you, for you if necessary, if you need to argue with a teacher, or not argue, but speak with a teacher, right? Find your administrator, find people around you who have a voice, perhaps louder than your own, until inshallah one day your voice becomes loud and you become the supporter for others. But as Brother Dalla mentioned, the most important part about speaking up is what? What did the Prophet ﷺ come for? The hadith is Sahih and Ahmed. I came for no other reason than to do what? To what? No. Thank you though, good, good point. I came, he summarized the entire mission, the 23 years of Risala in one sentence. I came for no other reason than to do this. Nope. Thank you, to perfect good character. Okay, so when speaking up and seeking help, and when speaking, use the best words, use the best manners. We as an ummah and we as individuals should be known for the best manners. Every time a person thinks of a Muslim, they should think, mashallah, these Muslims, they're so good. They have such good manners, they're honorable, right? They're trustworthy. What was the nickname of Rasulullah before he became a prophet? Al-Amin, which is what? Trustworthy, having the best of manners and morals, right? So this is how we should act when we speak. And going back to no fear, right? Once again, Allah SWT is on our side. We are not living our life for the people. And although we have those negative thoughts and we want, okay, I can't handle this. People are gonna be saying this stuff behind my back. You know, they're gonna laugh at me and make fun of me for standing up for others. Or I'm gonna give a voice to the voiceless, right? Those kids who can't stand up for themselves, they're so introverted, so shy, so beat up, I am will give the voice to the voiceless. And so you overcome that fear, knowing that you're helping somebody else. What's that called in our deen when you help somebody else out? It starts with a seen, or is it a sod? It's not with money, so it's not zakah, but it's something similar. When you help somebody out, this is a central part of our deen. We live a life of what? 
as Muslims, a life of what? Thank you, right? So helping others, sadaqa, helps us overcome our fear, right? Helping others out, giving a voice to the voices is our sadaqa, not only advocating for ourselves, but those around us as well. And last is give thanks. Give thanks to the people who helped you. Give thanks to the people who have overcome their own bullying perhaps, and perhaps are moving in a, in a better, uh, in, in, in a better direction so that we can become better as human beings, and inshallah better as an ummah, and better as a nation of human beings for that matter, but giving thanks. And that really is a summary of self-advocacy, right? So making sure we know what the problem is, naming it, right? You have to start with naming it, um, having the confidence, knowing Allah that has our back, using the best manners and morals, overcoming fear, and then giving thanks at the end. And if you ever are stuck, should I or should I not? What happens when you see? I gave all those examples at the front, right? What do you do when you see this? What would you do? Well, what would Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? What would Umar ibn Khattab do? Right? And those who know Umar ibn Khattab know what he would do. He wouldn't stand for it. If you don't know who he is, look him up, learn about him. But what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, would Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sit back and churn the other cheek? No, he would not. That's not from our deen. We stand up. It's a command, it's not an option, it's a command, right? We have no option, right? Make sense? So, if we're ever stuck, what will Muhammad do? And think back to the other uh, lectures, Brother Imran talked a lot about social media. You're flipping, you're flipping, flipping, you see an image. What will Muhammad do? We look at it, stare at it for five minutes, or move past it or turn it down. Like he said, put your phone down, right? Brother Dilawar talked about advocating for yourself and finding those accommodations. Someone says we can't pray because there's no supervisor. What would Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? He would go find the human rights code and show the principle that he must or she must offer accommodations. There's no question about it. I've talked for a long time. I'm asking for questions, but I think we're going to do a question and answer panel at the end. So I will just cut off here and invite uh, Maulana Bilal to take over. Jazakallah khairan. Hope that, inshallah, I, that you're able to benefit from this as myself and my family being able to benefit in preparing it. And again, I'm your brother in Islam, I'm here for you anytime you need. Omar.zia at peelsb.com. Anytime you need anything, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan, assalamu alaikum.